Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, this is the other uh, disease in the thorax, esophagus and G-junction adenocarcinomas are uh, less common uh, than lung cancer uh, in the U.S., at least uh, 18,000 uh, 18, new cases a year, seventh uh, leading cause of death in men. Uh, and unlike uh, gastric cancer, where worldwide and in the U.S. the incidence is actually decreasing, uh, G-junction adenocarcinomas are increasing, uh, particularly among young patients. Uh, the um, disease biology of it is changing, similar to what we heard from uh, Maureen from in lung cancer. You know, it's less uh, uh, squamous cell cancers now, uh, and adenocarcinoma is uh, much more common um, over the last three decades. Uh, we've made some progress in the management of these tumors uh, with uh, in this uh, over the last three decades with improvement in overall survival in clinical studies that has seen uh, 5% in the 70s uh, to 80s uh, and 90s now in, in, in current um, time uh, to 19% in some trials. Stage for, for stage though, this is a very aggressive disease. Uh, the AJCC staging was recently updated in 2010 and G-junction tumors are now included under esophageal cancer. Majority of our patients are presenting with node positive locally advanced disease. Uh, and as you can see, the survival falls below 40% pretty quickly for this, this adenocarcinoma. Within G-junction, uh, we subdivide these tumors on surgical uh, classification sewer type 1, 2, and 3. Uh, and this used to be relevant more for type 3 tumors where it was really approached more as uh, gastric tumors. Uh, but now really the sewer 1s uh, and 2s and most of 3 uh, uh, G junction tumors are still uh, considered esophageal adenocarcinoma. A majority of the, these arise in the distal esophagus with Barrett's as a um, underlying lesion. And so they're still considered uh, and treated as esophageal tumor. And this is an EOS uh, example uh, to um, really underline the importance of endoscopic uh, staging, particularly if the CT scan does not show radiographically apparent disease or a lymph node metastasis. Um, so for T1A lesions, uh, EMR, endoscopic mucosal resection uh, uh, could be appropriate, although it's a bit tricky, particularly if a tumor presents with an FDG avidity and, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a high risk of uh, lymph node involvement, these patients may be considered for surgery. Uh, T1B tumors, uh, primary operation, and majority of these tumors uh, are curable and they undergo Ivor Lewis esophagectomy. Uh, it's rare, however, for us to diagnose uh, these early stage tumors unless there is a, uh, you know, um, incidentally picked up lesion at the time of colonoscopy if the endoscopist plans and, and does an EGD or if there's bleeding complication. So majority of our tumors uh, are locally advanced, as you know, uh, node positive disease, locally advanced and very um, uh, aggressive. So uh, as uh, most of you agreed, uh, PET scan is an important part of staging. Uh, and there's data to support this, uh, uh, up to 15, even higher percent of uh, occult metastatic disease can be seen in patients with CT scans um, that are relatively uh, negative for M1 disease. So here is an example of, uh, you know, supraclavicular lymph node that was picked up on the PET scan. And you, I commonly see patients with local advanced disease thought to be curable and a bulky uh, or a small retroperitoneal lymph node, which is uh, a PET avid biopsied and is confirmed M1 disease. So those patients would not be offered curative resection, and really, you know, this is an important diagnosis to pick up early on. Uh, increasingly, PET scans are now used to uh, differentiate disease biology and to understand uh, the response uh, to chemotherapy, and this has been shown to be prognostic. Um, so the delta, the change in SUV uh, with chemotherapy uh, will predict response and surgery uh, outcome. Uh, so, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this data. Um, so, I mean, the bottom line and in the nutshell for EG, uh, new adjuvant therapy, uh, you know, surgery alone uh, is not sufficient in these local advanced tumors and there's poor outcomes, so something more than um, surgery needs to be done. These uh, tumors need to be staged with EOS and PET, and then really, uh, you know, there's uh, important, it's important to treat them, and whether or not you want to do chemotherapy or chemoradiation, 
um, is really the data is um, relatively su supports both. Although with chemo radiation, uh, that's uh, probably the data is stronger there for esophageal cancer, uh, and is uh, it is the standard in U.S. So uh, we'll talk about the chemo trials, uh, particularly the MAGIC study, which included uh, esophageal and GE junction uh, patients, and then the chemo radiation data. Chemo radiation alone uh, may be a standard for medically inoperable uh, patients, uh, elderly or frail, uh, or patients who declined chemotherapy uh, surgery. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the targeted agents, although, the, uh, you know, compared to other diseases, uh, gastric cancer and esophageal cancer, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, there's just been recently an explosion of uh, interest and uh, validation of targets. So a majority of them are still in metastatic um, setting, and therefore uh, nothing is yet uh, prime time or approved for preoperative disease. And again, we'll talk about how we use the PET scan to define disease biology. So um, in terms of chemotherapy uh, trial, you know, the consensus is that chemotherapy does help uh, in preoperative setting. And again, the, probably one of the uh, bigger uh, cohorts is the MAGIC trial published by Cunningham. This was a primarily, a primarily gastric cancer study, but about 20% of the patients on trial were esophageal and G-junction tumors. Uh, and overall, this was a positive study, so patients were randomized to receive surgery alone or chemotherapy uh, pre- and post-surgery, uh, and 13% overall survival benefit at five years. But again, small cohort of patients with G-junction and esophageal tumors relatively, no pathologic CRs in that group, uh, and no improvement in R0 resection rate. Another study, also European study, looked at um, smaller, sort of less intense, rather, chemotherapy, so no epirubicin, which, you know, as you know, a lot of these patients are nutritionally compromised, so getting three drugs um, into these patients, epirubicin, platinum, 5-FU may be tough. So this is another option, 5-FU, platinum, also 14% uh, overall response, uh, survival uh, benefited five years, and uh, the R0 resection was improved in this study. Right. Again, this was, um, you know, including gastric cancer patients. So um, there were three other studies that were less compelling in pre-op chemotherapy, and I, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll basically, uh, you know, skip the slide. But the uh, intergroup 113 study showed no overall survival. This was uh, published by Dr. Kelsen, New England Journal of Medicine. Um, also other patients, you know, larger studies. Uh, minimal improvement uh, in um, uh, R0 resection. Uh, but, you know, that being said, you know, it, the um, meta-analysis and all the data points that it's chemotherapy, if you're going to do um, surgery alone, that's ineffective. And so uh, if the radiation therapy is not an option, chemotherapy uh, should be used. And here is the uh, meta-analysis summarizing 10 trials and hazard ratio uh, for chemo um, is 0 0.87. Um, and this is the breakdown for squamous and adenocarcinomas. You know, historically, these trials uh, were in all comers, and again, including adenos and squames. Um, and so this data may be a little bit difficult to tease out. And going forward, um, uh, most studies are now specific for esophageal adenocarcinoma uh, or squamous cell cancer. So uh, uh, in terms of radiation therapy, this is uh, probably the most widely um, uh, you know, quoted study now. It was recently published in 2012 uh, uh, in New England Journal of Medicine. And this really validated the use of carbotaxel or carboplatin paclitaxel weekly uh, with the radiation therapy. You know, the historic radiation trials used 5-FU, uh, which is, can be cumbersome, difficult to um, uh, administer, and tolerate due to mucositis. So um, this trial uh, used carbotaxel um, and uh, uh, weekly with radiation therapy. So patients were randomized to do surgery uh, versus chemo radiation followed by surgery. And we'll... Um, so all patients were EOS staged. A majority of them were locally advanced, uh, T3, N0, or 1 disease, 74% uh, adenocarcinoma, so very applicable to our patient group, uh, where in U.S. it's mostly adenos. Um, and the, the treatment delivery rate was actually quite good, 93% of all courses of chemotherapy 
uh, and 23% uh, had grade three or greater toxicity uh, from pre-op therapy. Morbidity and mortality was almost identical in both groups. Um, so in terms of R0 resection, surgery alone, 69%, um, chemo radiation followed by surgery, uh, 92%. And here's the overall survival curve, hazard ratio 0 0.67, chemo radiation and surgery and surgery alone. <coughs> Uh, median survival 49% uh, in the experimental arm versus 24% in the um, surgery alone arm. And the hazard ratio, as you can see, for squames was even better, 0 0.53. Again, this is uh, a word to the biology of the disease, very sen sensitive to chemotherapy and the radiation. And looking at the subgroup analysis, all the subgroups appear to uh, benefit from chemo chemoradiation. <coughs> So the only real, you know, the question now remains, well, what is better, chemo or chemoradiation pre-op? And unfortunately, the data, uh, level one evidence for that is relatively uh, limited. Um, this was a trial that was attempted by Stahl and colleagues uh, and was unfortunately closed due to poor accrual uh, and it was overall um, underpowered. But patients were uh, randomized uh, to receive chemotherapy, which is, you know, cisplatin and leucovorin with five of few. Uh, versus chemoradiation, with, followed by surgery, and they used the top aside with the radiation. Um, and although it was closed uh, early, and again, it's because, again, out there uh, in the real world, people feel very uh, polarized and strongly about whether or not their uh, patients are gonna get chemoradiation or chemotherapy preoperatively. Uh, and so it's a, it's a difficult uh, treatment to randomize patients to. Uh, 59 uh, patients treated on chemotherapy and 60 on chemoradiation. And as you can see, there was a trend um, toward improved local control uh, and overall survival. But again, underpowered study, um, median survival was also trending to be better for radiation. Um, and in a, a meta-analysis of 13 trials, again, hazard ratio for chemoradiation, 0.78 favoring uh, the intervention over surgery alone, um, and uh, squames hazard ratio 0 0.8, uh, similar to adenocarcinomas. So again, the bottom line is something more than surgery needs to be done. You can use um, the magic approach and do pre-op chemotherapy uh, if uh, the radiation therapy is somewhat contraindicated. Um, uh, but really chemo radiation is the standard. It's uh, well tolerated and in preoperative setting maybe uh, um, an optimal uh, backbone to build on for targeted therapies as opposed to three drug combination uh, with cytotoxic therapies. And this is the NCCN guidelines uh, for uh, management of uh, localized esophageal and G-junction tumors. Um, so most of our patients are in this group, uh, you know, the. Uh, surgical community um, uh, deals with these folks. So locally advanced, uh, node positive disease, um, really pre-op chemoradiation is preferred and carbotoxyl uh, is really now becoming the uh, standard. It's uh, well tolerated and easy to give. Uh, and definitive chemoradiation sh should be reserved in adenocarcinoma setting, and we'll talk a little bit about it, uh, for patients who either decline surgery or are medically unfit for an operation. Pre-op chemotherapy is also, uh, uh, you know, defensible and an uh, and and acceptable option. So um, what is the role of surgery? Uh, how good are we at predicting uh, complete response? So, you know, if a patient completes chemoradiation, uh, usually we give them about five to six weeks uh, to recover and repeat an endoscopy. Uh, and we see, um, you know, complete response. So uh, at, at the time of endoscopy. We know that uh, on surgical specimens, the uh, complete response rate is relatively low, 23% in a cross trial, and you'll see it's a recurring theme. Um, so surgery should be considered for adenocarcinomas in most patients, unless they're elderly or frail, or if there, you know, needs to be a delay in operation. Uh, this can be a salvage procedure. So uh, Nito Sarkari from MSKC looked at this uh, uh, data of 137 patients treated at our institution uh, with cisplatin-based chemoradiation. So again, uh, uh, they all had an endoscopy and biopsy, 
uh, and then went on to have surgery. So although 76% of patients had negative biopsy post-therapy, we know in adenocarcinomas it's a poor predictor because only 35% of those patients, even though they immediately went to an operation, um, had a pathologic CR at surgery. Uh, for uh, squamous cell cancer, the negative biopsy is a better predictor, and uh, you know some of our squames uh, we actually observe, and they don't go to the OR. Well, what about a PET scan? You know, we talked about PET scan; it may be a useful tool to stage. Can we uh, detect pathologic CR, predict them uh, with uh, uh, PET? So uh, Nabil Risk looked at this data: 493 patients pre-op chemo radiation. Um, PET scan prior uh, and after chemo radiation. Majority of them were adenos. PATH CR again, 27%, similar to what we saw in CROSS. And unfortunately, PET response was not associated with PATH CR. Interestingly, if you again look at the squames, um, if you have an SUE reduction of 75% or more, so let's say it went from you know 10 to 2, like that patient I showed you in the beginning. The uh, path CR is, uh, you know, we can't predict path CR in 85%. So what about the PET scan um, and use it as an early detection tool? So uh, Weber and colleagues, um, uh, you know, really pioneered this from Germany, and the idea was to look at pre-op chemotherapy and esophageal and G-junction cancers um, and predict who is going to do poorly after adjuvant therapy. So they defined uh, PET responders based on SUV decline, so a delta of 35% at least, um, and uh, imaged them pretty quickly after first two weeks uh, of treatment. Uh, and uh, we'll look at the curves in a little bit, but essentially two-year survival, so they, you know, they went on to have surgery, uh, and the two-year survival for PET responders was 60%, 6-0 versus 37% for non-responders. So again, uh, identifying aggressive disease biology and likely chemotherapy resistance. So Florian Lordig took it a step further and um, asked the question, well, if the chemotherapy is ineffective, why administer it? Why not just go to, uh, straight to the OR? And so um, instead of, uh, so what they did was, instead of continuing ineffective chemotherapy in a non-responder, the patient went straight to the OR, and the responders, again, delta of 35 or more, um, continued uh, with chemotherapy and then went on to have resection. And so, and these are the survival curves. So this is the chemotherapy for 12 weeks in all patients. This was the Weber uh, data. So PET responders do much better than PET non-responders. And PET non-responders had 18 months survival in, median uh, in this uh, group. And the Municon, the Lordic data, uh, where they went and to the operating room, they were actually able to rescue the non-responders. So it's, although it's intra-trial comparison, but it was 26 months versus 18 months. Uh, again, hypothesis generating, you know, is this, um, are we just, uh, you know, picking up the bad players? Are you not going to be able to impact their survival with chemo? So why not do an operation sooner? Um, so. Will changing in chemotherapy then improve outcome? If, you know, we know majority of these patients will die of disease recurrence and they have micrometastatic disease, um, in, instead of taking them straight to an operation, should we uh, just change their chemo? And this is um, the hypothesis in actually two, on, uh, one trial is already open and another one will be opening uh, next year probably. This is a PET-directed study in esophageal adenocarcinoma, so the radiation study. CLGB80803, this is a cooperative group study. Again, this is a rel relatively rare disease, and 75% of the patients with esophageal cancer present with metastatic disease, so to do a new adjuvant study, you really need to do it in the setting of a cooperative group. So uh, local advanced disease, which is PET-AVID, patients are randomized, and PET-AVIDity is defined as SUV of five, at least. Um, they are randomized to receive five of few platinum, and Folfox is now uh, really um, better tolerated and has been validated in phase two um, trials. So Folfox versus carbotaxol induction. After two cycles of chemotherapy, everyone gets a PET scan day 29 and 30, uh, to 35. And if they're PET responders, they're continued on the same chemotherapy with the radiation. This one. 
Um, and the pet non-responders, so even if their SUV is dropped by 20%, they would still be considered non-responders. Um, they're crossing over uh, to the salvage arm. So if they got Taxol and Carboplatin, they'll get Fulfox and so on. And so the, and then they're all go on to uh, uh, surgery and we will look at pathologic response and uh, uh, survival as a secondary endpoint. Um, any questions about that before I move on to other things? Oh. So uh, in terms of uh, targeted therapy, you know, we will, um, the bottom line is, as in other diseases, uh, an agent needs to be validated in metastatic setting before we bring it um, into a preoperative setting. And uh, we, you know, um, have gotten pretty sophisticated with uh, testing for um, biomarkers, but the bottom line, in, you know, in esophageal and in gastric cancer, um, the, uh, there are very few validated biomarkers right at this moment. We are trying to suppress both metastatic disease and also local uh, disease control. Uh, and radio radiation therapy is an important part of the, uh, the treatment algorithm for local advanced disease. So uh, safety and toxicity in combination with chemotherapy and radiation needs to be um, considered. Um, so, uh, you know, mutations are rare um, in our disease. And, uh, you know, the um, TCGA uh, for gastric and uh, G-junction tumors have recently been published. And we know that KRAS and BRAF mutations are rare. You know, uh, uh, or, uh, amplifications, you know, uh, may be the important um, way to uh, characterize this disease. And so EGFR amplifications occur in 15%. Uh, of tumors and, you know, uh, preliminary data from our institution uh, indicate that may be, uh, be a mechanism of trastuzumab resistance. Um, the GEF overexpression uh, does occur, but again, uh, unlikely to be a, a useful marker to uh, enrich for patients that benefit from the GEF therapy. HER2 is the only validated uh, marker to predict response to trastuzumab, and as you all know, it's FDA approved in management of uh, locally uh, or metastatic G-junction um, or gastric cancers. And uh, in actually in G-junction tumors, it's not a that rare of occurrence. It, it's seen in approximately 30% of patients. MET is the next exciting target. Again, both immunohistochemistry of expression and amplifications occur, uh, and uh, a number of MET inhibitors are now in uh, phase three studies and phase two studies in metastatic setting. Um, so just, you know, uh, in terms of uh, targeted therapies, uh, trastuzumab is the only treatment uh, that is the closest um, to um, being prime time in uh, preoperative uh, treatment of esophageal cancer. RTOG 1010 study is well underway and ho hopefully will be finished in the near future looking at combination of carbotaxol with trastuzumab and radiation in um, uh, uh, local advanced disease. There was a number of disappointing negative studies with bevacizumab and cetuximab, and going back to the question that I brought up uh, in the pretest, you know, uh, cetuximab has not been validated to study, uh, to use in metastatic setting negative studies, and with the chemo radiation in esophageal cancer, it, uh, it can actually be detrimental. Um, there is an ongoing bevacizumab EOX study in gastric cancer but the phase three Avagast study did not, in metastatic setting, didn't meet its primary endpoint. So it's unlikely that bevacizumab is gonna be uh, approved for this indication. MET uh, inhibitors are underway, uh, and really biomarker selection for selection uh, for these trials is key, and, and that's why it needs to be done on a multi-center basis. So what about management of residual disease? Um, you know, uh, I get asked this question a lot, both by surgeons and colleagues at outside institutions. You know, what if you finish chemo radiation, carbotaxel, you know, surgery, and you have residual N1 or N2 disease, so a residual node positive disease? So clearly, you know, uh, we didn't uh, accomplish a lot with pre-op chemotherapy in these patients. Uh, is there any utility uh, in uh, continuing? Uh, chemotherapy. And, um, you know, there is no data to support continuing chemotherapy in that setting. We know from the MAGIC study um, that, you know, doing pre-op chemotherapy surgery and post-op chemotherapy is pretty much 
the overall survival improvement is similar to just doing pre-op chemotherapy with the radiation. So doing additional ineffective chemotherapy is unlikely uh, to impact survival in these patients. And you know, the toxicity can be quite substantial. And by the time they're ready for chemotherapy, really it's, it's been months, four months plus after uh, their surgery, and it's no longer considered to be you know, adjuvant therapy if it's, um, it's been this long, and you're not gonna impact their metastatic disease. So that's why you know, uh, the trial that we're opening now through the CLGB and running the study is to really try to suppress micrometastatic disease with targeted agents. And the agent we're using is regorafenib, which is an, a multi-VEGF inhibitor, which is now FDA approved in colon, and there's promising data um, in metastatic setting. So um, with that, I'll stop.